and welcome to a new video from Jogla66, Hour of the Truth. As of course you have seen with the intro, this is another reading of uh, Edmond Paris' book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. But before I continue, I want to make a little announcement, even though that uh, is not of that much interest, but I want to just tell you that up to this part I have read uh, the German part of the same book uh, simultaneously. And then I decided uh, to read the German book in its completion, and I finished that a few days ago, two days ago to be precise. Today's we, today we have the 15th of uh, August 2017, and so now I'm starting to read the English version of The Secret History of the Jesuits in its completion. So within the very next few weeks that I can complete this, and then after that start my next project in English as I'm starting my next project in German also. just want to tell you that the simultaneous reading I, I've stopped for the moment. So this is today the next part of the reading, The Secret History of the Jesuits. We are still in section 4, in chapter 4. And it's been quite a while since I have been reading, I think uh, uh, several months even. <laughs> so I have to get into it a little bit, but yeah, you know, I just read the German part, so in that case it's not so bad. I guess I'm quite into this. So without any further ado, let's uh, continue here. The wonderful book from Edmond Paris, The Secret History of the Jesuits in Chapter 4. The rebirth of the Society of Jesus during the 19th century. So we are speaking about in this part of the book, the time of the revival of the Jesuits who have been actually been banned by a papal bull, uh, Dominus Ac Redemptor, uh, forever. Forever. So when the popes then, uh, a little bit later in 1817, are declared infallible by the council, by the Vatican Council in 1870, the first Vatican Council, they are declared infallible. How can it be that a Pope signs a order to banish the Jesuits yeah, forever and ever, and just 41 years later, I, I, I thought I had a picture of this here, but I, I don't. And just 41 years later, uh, the Jesuits are reinstalled in their service again. I, I don't get it. Maybe you get it. How are the popes infallible if that happens? Anyway, let's start the rebirth of the Society of Jesus during the 19th century. We mentioned that, the author starts here, that when Clement the nine, uh, the fourteenth was constrained to suppress the Jesuit order, he apparently said, I have cut off my right hand. The phrase seems plausible enough. The Holy See must certainly have found it hard to part with its most important instrument in the, uh, in the domination of the world. The order's disgrace, a political measure imposed by circumstances, was gradually uh, attenuated by the successors of Clement XIV, Pius VI and Pius VII, all both antichrists. Never ever forget, the papacy is the antichrist. Antichrist Pius VI and Pius VII gradually attenuated the Jesuit order. Yeah. And if the official eclipse of the Jesuits lasted 40 years, or 41, from 1773 to 1814, it was because of the upheavals in Europe resulting from the French Revolution. In any case, that eclipse was never total. Why was this eclipse of the Jesuit order being... Uh, how do I want to say that? Being banished totally, never total, because during the banishment of the Jesuits, the Illuminati rose up. The German Jesuit professor at Jesuit um, Ingolstadt University in Bavaria, Adam Weishaupt, founded the Illuminati 
and the meaning of the Illuminati was, or the purpose of the Illuminati was, to take over the work of the Jesuits during their suppression. It's easy as that. We saw that already in me reading Rulers of Evil, and we are going to see this also here. I'm not going too deep into this right now, but we will see how many more comments I make during this reading. Anyway, the author himself says that the eclipse was never total. Well, it was never total because the Jesuits never really stopped to exist. Quote, Most of the Jesuits had stayed in Austria, France, Spain, Italy, mingling with the clergy. They met with each other or gathered in large numbers as much as possible. In 1794, Jean de Tunely founded the Society of the Sacred Heart in Belgium as a teaching body. Many Jesuits joined it. Three years later, the Tyrolean Pacanari, who thought it was another, uh, who, who thought he was another Ignatius de Loyola, founded the Society of the Brothers of Faith. In 1799, the two societies merged with Father Clarivier as the head. He was the only surviving French Jesuit, Father Clarivier. In 1803, they joined the Russian Jesuits. Something coherent was coming back to life again, but the masses, and even most of the politicians, did not recognize it at first. The French Revolution and then the Empire gave the Company of Jesus an unexpected credibility again. It was a defensive reaction against new ideas springing up in the ancient monarchies. Napoleon I described the society as, quote, very dangerous. She will never be allowed in the Empire, unquote. But when the Holy Alliance triumphed, the new monarchs did not disdain the help of the absolutists, in bringing back the people to a strict obedience. But times had changed. All the skill of the good fathers could only delay and not stop the propagation of liberal ideas, and their efforts were more harmful than useful, as always. In France, the Restoration experienced it in a bitter way. Louis the Seventeenth, an unbeliever and clever politician, tried to contain the rise of the ultras, as much as he could. What are the ultras? We are speaking of the ultramontane, meaning the totally to the Pope devoted Jesuits. Uh, Tridentine Jesuits, if you, uh, you want to see it that way. Yeah? The ultras are the ultramontane. Um, but under Charles X's narrow-minded and very devout, the Jesuits had it easy. Now, Charles X's. Now, I'm going to look if I have a picture for you here. Uh, because I thought uh, that I have prepared some pictures already from the German reading at that time. Uh, but I don't have that here. And this is actually in the fourth section, so I don't know. No, I don't find it here. Uh, ten, let's see if he gives it here. Charles the Ten, King of France. Here it is. Uh, let's see where I can find that. Oh yeah, in the sixth section. Okay. <laughs> here we have Charles the Tenth. Okay. King of France. He was narrow-minded, but he was very devout. The Jesuits had it easy under him. The law which expelled them in 1764 was still being enforced. No matter. They enlivened the famous congregation, first kind of Opus Dei. This pious brotherhood, Opus Dei, composed of ecclesiastics and laymen, was found everywhere pretending to purge the army and magistracy, in uh, the administration, the teaching profession, it held missions all over the country, planting commemorative crosses wherever it went. Many of these are still there today. It stirred up the believers to fight the infidels and made itself so hateful that even the very Catholic and very legitimist Montlosier exclaimed, uh, quote, Our missionaries have started fires everywhere. If something has to be sent to us, we would rather have Marseille's plague 
than more missionaries, unquote. <laughs> so <laughs> they would rather have Marseille's plagues instead of missionaries, meaning missionaries of the Jesuits. Yeah? Rather the plague than Jesuits. In 1828, Charles X withdrew the order's right to teach, but it was too late. The dynasty collapsed in 1830. Hated and coveted with shame, the sons of Loyola nevertheless stayed in France, but disguised as the order was still officially abolished. Louis Philippe and Napoleon III tolerated them. The Republic scattered them in 1880 only under the administration of Jules Ferry. The closing of their establishments was effective only in 1901 under the law of separation. During the 19th century the company's history in America and half of Europe was equally full of ups and downs in the past while fighting the new ideas. Just gonna change the picture here again. Quote, wherever liberal, liber, liberal minded people gained victories, the Jesuits were expelled. On the one hand, when the other side triumphed, they re established themselves to defend the throne and the altar. So, they were banished from Portugal in 1834, in Spain in 1820, 1835, and 16, uh, 1868, from Switzerland 1848. Germany 1872 under Bismarck and the Second Reich, and in France in 1880 and in 1901. And in that time between 1880 and 1901, I can tell you we are going to read some astounding history in this book about the Dreyfus affair. But that's coming up in a later part of this book. Quote, in Italy from 1859 on, all their colleges and establishments were gradually taken from them, so much so that they were forced to stop all the activities prescribed in their laws. The same thing happened in the republics of Latin America. The order was suppressed in Guatemala in 1872, Mexico in 1873, Brazil 1874, Ecuador and Colombia 1875, and even in Costa Rica in 1884. <laughs> you know that wherever the Jesuits are expelled from, they are going to take revenge. Yeah. So look at all these countries where you see, where you have seen in recent years regime changes, where you have seen political upheaval and all that stuff, uh, revolts, uh, civil wars, um, and then you know why? Because the Jesuits are for payback. They never forget, and they never forgive. The only countries, and, and just another point that I want to make, when you see how the, uh, the Jesuit order has been expelled here between 1834 in Portugal and 1884 in Costa Rica, all these different countries, you see the same pattern as before the Jesuits had been banished completely, you know. Just remember the time before 1773, the Jesuits were already banished from some 60 or 70 countries before they were completely banished, abolished by the Pope. And then they came back in 1814 and again countries threw them out, banished the Jesuits again and again and again. Why aren't we not seeing that today anymore? Well, that's a question that you can answer for yourself after having studied the completion of this book. I can tell you because the Jesuits absolutely reign supreme over the world today. Whether you like it or you don't, study it and then you will see it. This book maybe help you with that. We continue with a quote. The only countries where the Jesuits lived in peace were the states where Protestantism was in the majority. Aha! Uh -huh. So, where Protestantism reigns... Where Protestantism reigns, the Jesuits could live in peace. Why? Probably because they were disguised as Freemasons. England, Sweden, Denmark, the United States of America. And also, not to forget, in Prussia, except for the time that they were expelled in 1872 in Germany. It may seem surprising at first glance, but... Uh, but the explanation lies in the fact that these countries 
that in these countries the fathers were never able to exercise a political influence. Without any doubt, they accepted the fact more by necessity, more by necessity than inclination. Otherwise, they would have taken every opportunity to influence legislation and administration, in a direct manner by maneuvering the ruling classes or indirectly by constantly stirring up the Catholic masses. Unquote. Well, I do not agree with what the author says here. Because the author says here, in these countries the fathers were never able to exercise political influence. So that means, in countries like England, I agree. In countries like Sweden, I do agree a little bit less. Like Denmark, I also agree a little bit less. But United States of America, I don't agree at all. Why? Because I refer you to my broadcast that I did in the past on Hour of the Truth, where I was uh, doing multiple broadcasts on the founding of the United States of America to teach to the people who do not know the real history of the United States of America how the Jesuits via Freemasonry infiltrated the government of the United States from the beginning. And I'm speaking about the time of 1776 and afterwards. The government of the United States of America was Roman Catholic from the beginning, but it was disguised. And every American president who did not adhere to the orders of the Jesuits or the Roman Catholic Church was assassinated. The Americans lost a lot of American presidents that were assassinated because they were not listening to the orders given to them by the Jesuits. This is a very important point. So when the author says here that the fathers were never able to exercise a political influence in, for example, the United States of America, well, look to the United States of America today. That country is totally taken over by the Jesuit order, by the Roman, by Roman Catholics. Why? Because they were working for the last 250 years to do this. That's why. And when you see that Ronald Reagan was the first American president facing the obelisk that was assigned to Catholics and Jesuits worldwide that now America has been conquered, when you know that, then you know that for the last 40 years, uh, or 30 uh, something years, because uh, Reagan that was in the beginning of the 80s, for the last 30 years something, almost 40 years something, America has been totally taken over. So, there is political influence in these countries, but not directly via the Jesuit order, but via their other secret societies, via Opus Dei on the one hand and via the Freemasons on the other. Especially the Freemasons. Watch my video from Inquisition Update on my channel. Freemasons are in the churches. The Freemasons have taken over a lot of the pulpits of the Baptists and Methodists and other uh, denominations in the United States of America and they are all led by the Jesuit order. So, the Jesuits had much success but connivingly disguised. Anyway, to continue here and then bring this little part of this book to a uh, completion, to be truthful, this immunity of the Protestant countries towards Jesuitic ventures was far from complete. In the United States, wrote M. Philip Miller, the company has deployed a systematic and fruitful activity for a long time, and she is not hindered by any laws. Quote, I am not happy about the rebirth of the Jesuits, wrote former president of the, uh, of the United States, John Adams, to his successor, Thomas Jefferson, in 1816. Quote, Swarms of them will present themselves under more disguises ever taken by even the king of the gypsies as printers, writers, publishers, school teachers, etc. If ever an association of people deserved eternal damnation on this earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola. Yet, with our system of religious liberty, we can but offer them a refuge. And Jefferson answered his predecessor, Like you, I object to the Jesuits' re-establishment, which makes light give way to darkness. Unquote. 
the fears so expressed were to be proved right one century later, as we shall see. One century later, you ask, dear listener? Yes, because you have the reinstallation of the Jesuits in 1814 and you have the start of the First World War in 1914, a century later, as the author here explains. Okay, let's go on to chapter 5. In section 4, it is called the Second Empire and the Falul War Law, the War of 1870. So we are diving into a real history of France, uh, because the author, Edmond Paris, is French. And he is speaking about the Second Empire of France. And we are speaking about the time after the French Revolution. So, in the previous chapter, we mentioned the wide tolerance enjoyed by the Society of Jesus in France under Napoleon III, even though it was officially prohibited. Now, Napoleon III, let's see if I have his picture here. I thought I did prepare that. Yeah, here it is, Napoleon III. So, we can enjoy his picture here when we are reading here on him. In any case, it could not be otherwise, as that regime owed its, exis uh, its, ex its existence, largely at least, to the Roman Church, whose support never failed, as long as the regime lasted. But it was to be very, very costly for France. Yeah. As we will learn when we read on in this book, it is always very costly for the countries when the Jesuits have anything to say in these countries. The readers of the Progrès du Pas de Calais, a publication for which the future emperor wrote several articles in 1843 and 1844, could not then suspect him of lenience towards ultramontanism, judging from the following. Quote, the clergy demands, under the cover of freedom of teaching, the right to instruct youth. Oh, uh, what, what, what did we just read here? The clergy demands, under cover of freedom of teaching, the right to instruct youth. So, that means that the spiritual power, the church, demands, under the cover of freedom of teaching, the right to instruct youth. You see, this is why we today are all made Catholic without even our knowledge. Because our complete school system, our complete teaching system in schools, in universities, everywhere, is in hands of the Roman Catholic Church. So when we are not aware of that, that doesn't change the fact that Roman Catholic teaching is taught to us and to our children and to our grandchildren all over the place and has been taught to our parents and our grandparents before. We have to wake up to that deception that in school you really learn something that can advance you in this life. The only thing that you can learn from is the Bible. And the Bible is not taught in schools, the Bible is not taught in libraries and not taught in universities. So it's Roman Catholicism, Gnosticism, that is told everywhere. Learning against learning. Remember from rulers of evil? The learning of the teaching of man against the teaching of God. Learning against learning. Medici learning. That is still what is today. And here we have another point where the author says that. In this quote from uh, Napoleon III, who wrote several articles here, it, it says the clergy demands, the clergy, that is the church hierarchy, demands under the cover of freedom of teaching the right to instruct youth. The state, on the other hand, so the civil power, also demands the right to direct public instruction for their own interests. So, you have a conflict of interests between the civil power and the ecclesiastical, the spiritual power. 
This struggle is the result of divergent opinions, ideas and feelings between government and church. Both want to influence the new generations coming up in opposite directions and for their own benefit. We do not believe, as one well-known orator does, that all ties between the clergy and civil authority must be broken in order to stop this diversion. Unfortunately, France ministers of religion are generally opposed to democratic interests. To allow them to build schools without control is to encourage them to teach the people the hatred of revolution and liberty. Unquote. And again, quote, the clergy will stop being ultramontane as soon as one compels them to be brought up as formerly in an up-to-date manner and to mingle with the people gaining their education from the same sources at, as, uh, as the general public." Unquote. Now, referring to the way in which German priests were trained, the author clarifies his thoughts in the following manner. Quote, Instead of being shut away from the rest of the world from childhood and so, to be, uh, and so be instilled in the seminaries with hatred for the society in which they must live, they would... What is this now? <laughs> uh, they would... Uh, where is... Uh, what is this? They would, and then it continues. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, this is uh, another kind of writing here, so this makes it difficult for me. I'm, I'm very sorry for this uh, little mishap here, but uh, let's see. Um, referring to the way in which German priests were trained, the author clarifies his thoughts in the following manner. I'm going to change the picture here, and then we're going to continue. Quote, instead of being shut away from the rest of the world from childhood and so be instilled in the seminaries with hatred for the society in which they must live, they would learn early to be citizens before being priests. Unquote. That's quite an interesting quote, don't you think? Let's read this again. Instead of being shut away from the rest of the world from childhood, and so be instilled in the seminaries with hatred for the society in which they must live, they would learn early to be citizens before being priests. This did not encourage political clericalism for the future sovereign than a carbonari. But the ambition to sit on the throne soon made him more docile towards Rome. I don't know why this is smaller here. I have it difficult to read this, so I'm going to push this up a little bit. This does not encourage political clericalism for the future sovereign than a carbonari, but the ambition to sit on the throne soon made him more docile towards Rome. Did not Rome herself help him climb the first step? Quote, Having been made president of the Republic on the 10th of December 1848, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte gathers several ministers around himself, one of which is M. de Fallou. Who is this M. de Fallou? A tool of the Jesuits. Now let's see if I have a picture of Fallou. Because I prepared some pictures here, I know. I don't know, but I know I don't have Fallou in here. So, uh, Charles the Sense, but we have Napoleon the Third, right? So let's take this picture again. Who is this M. de Fallou? A tool of the Jesuits. On the 4th of January 1849, he institutes a commission whose job is to, quote, prepare a big legislative reform of primary and secondary education, unquote. In the course of the discussion, M. Cousin takes the liberty to remark that maybe the Church is wrong to tie her destiny to the Jesuits. Monsignor Dupanloup defends energet uh, energetically the society. A law on teaching is being prepared which would make amends to the Jesuits. In the past, the state and the university had been protected against the Jesuits' invasions. We were wrong and unjust. We demanded that the government applied its laws against these agents from a sovereign government and we ask their forgiveness for it. 
They are good citizens who were slandered and misjudged. What can we do to show them the respect and esteem which are due to them? Put in their hands the teaching of the young generations. Now, this is, this is the sentence that we should really highlight and read again as the answer of the question that is proposed here. The French crawl back and say, oh, we have done wrong to the wonderful Jesuit order. They are good citizens who were slandered and misjudged. What can we do to show the Jesuits the respect and esteem we are due to them? Well, put in their hands the teaching of the young generations. And as we will learn later on in this book, Hitler said the same. Give me the youth and I'm going to give you a people that you will not even recognize. In this, in this sense, he had a quote. And we will learn that later when you read on in this book. So, France crawls back. Everything that we did to the Jesuits, oh, we were so wrong. They are good citizens who were slandered and misjudged. What can we do to repay them? Put in their hands the teaching of the young generation. Yeah, give them the youth. This is in fact the aim of the law of the 15th of March 1850. This law appoints a superior council for public instruction in which the clergy dominates. In the first article we read it makes a clergy masters of the schools. It makes the clergy masters of the schools. So they are being taught everything from a standpoint of Roman Catholicism, right? when the clergy are masters of schools. In Article 44 it says it gives religious associations the right to create free schools without having to explain about the non-authorized congregations, meaning the Jesuits. In Article 17, uh, paragraph 2, it says it said that the letters of obedience would be their diplomas. And in Article 49 it states M. Barthelemy St. Hilaire tries in vain to demonstrate that the aim of the authors of that project is to give the monopoly to the clergy and that this law would be fatal to the university. Meaning, when the clergy takes over the teaching, the university would be fatally hit. Victor Hugo exclaims also vainly, quote, this law is a monopoly in the hands of those who try to make teaching come out of the sacristy and the government out of the confessional. Unquote. This is a very important sentence from Victor Hugo, who was a French writer in the 19th century. This law, Victor Hugo says, is a monopoly, <coughs> you know, this law, um, on the 15th of March of 1850, that we speak about here, is a monopoly in the hands of those who try to make teaching come out of the sacristy and the government out of the confessional. So that means that teaching and government are completely in spiritual hands, completely in the hands of the Antichrist Church of Rome. But the assembly ignores these protestations. It prefers listening to M. de Montalembert who exclaims, quote, We will be swallowed up if we don't stop immediately the current trend of rationalism and demagogy. What's more, it can be stopped only with the help of the church. Unquote. Monsieur de Montalembert adds these words to make sure the significance of this law is well described. Quote, to the demoralizing and anarchical army of teachers, we must oppose the army of the clergy. Unquote. But the law was passed. Never before in France had the Jesuits won a more complete victory. A complete victory, you ask? Yes. Because, as we just read here before, as Victor Hugo exclaims, that we try to make teaching come out of the sacristy 
and the government out of the confessional. That is a complete victory of the Jesuits in France. How did they achieve that? First of all, by getting rid of all the kings who did not do their bidding completely and the French Revolution. And now they are back. Monsieur de Montalembert admitted it proudly. He said, quote, I am defending justice by backing as well as possible the government of the Republic, which has done so much to save order and maintain the union of the French people. It especially rendered more services to the Catholic Church than all the other governments in power during the last two centuries. Unquote. Now all this happened more than 100 years ago from the standpoint of Edmond Paris in 1975 when he published the book, but seems rather familiar today, he says. So, what does Edmond Paris mean in this little sentence? All this, what we've just read, the establishment of the Jesuit order giving them the freedom of teaching in that country, happened more than a hundred years ago, but seems rather familiar today, even now in 1975, when this book was published. But let us see how the Republic, presided over by Prince Louis Napoleon, was acting internationally. So we are back to Napoleon the Third. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a, another picture of Napoleon the Third here. We just can't get rid of this guy. The revolution of 1848 had, amongst their repercussions in Europe, provoked the uprising of the Romans against Pope Pius IX, their temporal sovereign who had fled to Gaeti. The Roman Republic had been proclaimed. Through a scandalous paradox, it was the French Republic, in agreement with the Austrians and the King of Naples, who put back the throne the undesirable uh, who put back on the throne the undesirable sovereign. Quote, a French regiment besieged Rome, took it on the 2nd of June 1849 and restored pontifical power. It managed to maintain itself with the help of a French division of occupation which left Rome only after the first disasters in the Franco-German War of 1870. You know, the Franco-German War, that was the war that um, Bismarck fought against the French for the liberty of the Second German Reich that he founded then in 1871 that uh, went down in 1980 with the end uh, 1918 with the end of the very first world war um, but more interesting even to understand uh, with this is that this french division uh, of co uh, of occupation which left rome only after the first disasters in the franco-german war um, this leaving of uh, of the rome of the vatican of the french troops actually happened in 1866 a forerunner of 1870 and this 1866 is important then because it goes back to the prediction in Revelation and in Daniel where we speak about the 1260 years that lasted, the reign of the Antichrist, that lasted from 606 to 1866. Not, as you probably all have been taught by Seventh-day Adventists, from 538 through 1798 but from 606 to 1866. And for that, I refer you to the book of Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gretton Guinness, where you can read that. And I refer you also to the book of Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylons, where you can read the same. But let's continue here. This beginning was very promising. Quote, the coup of the 2nd of December 1851 brought about the proclamation of the empire. Louis Napoleon, president of the Republic, had favored the Jesuits in every way. Now emperor, he refused nothing to his accomplices and allies. The clergy poured out its blessings and te deum profusely on the massacres and proscriptions of the 2nd of December. The one responsible for this abominable ambush was looked upon as a, provincial, a providential savior. Quote, the Archbishop of Paris, Monseigneur Sibourg, who saw the massacres on the boulevard, exclaims, quote, The man who was prepared by God has come. The finger of God was never more visible than in the events which produced these great results. Unquote. 
What is this Monsignor Sibur speaking about? About this Napoleon III. He is the quote-unquote man of God, because the Jesuits have been completely restored in France at that time. Yeah? So, the Bishop of Saint-Fleur said from his pulpit, on the other hand, quote, God pointed out Louis Napoleon. He already had elected him to be emperor. Yes, my dear brethren, God consecrated him beforehand through the blessing of his pontiffs and priests. He claimed him himself. Can we not recognize God's elect? Unquote. What God is he talking about? Of course, the God of the Roman Catholic Church, which is Satan. The man who was prepared by God, the man who was prepared by God on earth, as he calls himself, the pontiff, the pope, has come, he says here. And speaking about the emperor, who completely restored the Jesuits at the time in France and gave them the possibility to proclaim all these laws of the education of the youth. The Bishop of Nevers falsely saluted Providence's visible instrument, quote, These pitiable adulations, which could be multiplied still further, deserved a reward. This reward was a complete freedom given to the Jesuits as long as the empire lasted. The Society of Jesus was literally master of France for 18 years. She enriched herself the order of the Jesuits, multiplied her establishments and spread her influence. Her action was felt in all the important events of that time, especially, especially in the expedition to Mexico and the declaration of war in 1870. The empire means peace, declared the new sovereign. But barely two years after he acceded to the throne, the first of all those wars which succeeded each other throughout his reign started. So, the empire means peace, but barely two years after he acceded to the throne, the first of all those wars which succeeded each other throughout his reign started. What does the Bible say? Through Peace he will destroy many, the Antichrist. And Napoleon III is nothing more than a puppet in the hands of the Antichrist. Through peace he will destroy many. The empire means peace, he says, and then he starts wars. History could regard the motives which brought about these wars as unconnected if we didn't see what united them. The defense of of the Roman Church's interests. That's what it all is all about. There is never fought a war in this world that is not in defense or in advancement of the Roman Church's interests. The Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Antichrist, is really going on. We are speaking now about the Crimean War, the first of these mad enterprises which weakened us and was not nationally profitable, is a characteristic example. It was not someone anti-clerical, but the Abbe Brugret, who wrote, quote, One must read the speeches the famous Theatine Father Ventura gave in the chapel of Le Tullier during Lent 1857. He presented the empire's restoration as God's work and praised Napoleon III for having defended the religion in Crimea and made the great days of the Crusades shine a second time in the East. The Crimean War was regarded as a complement to the Roman expedition. It was praised by the whole clergy, full of admiration for the religious fervor of the troops besieging Sebastopol. St. Beuve movingly narrated how Napoleon III had sent an image of the Virgin to the French fleet. Now, the Crimean War that we are talking about here is of course a war against Russia. Crimea, right? Why? B 
because there is the Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox Church is an enemy of the Roman Catholic Church. But I think we even go deeper into the Crimean War later on in this book, so let's continue reading here. What was this expedition which aroused the enthusiasm of the clergy? M. Paul Lyon, member of the Institute, explains, quote, A quarrel between monks revives the question of the East. It was born out of rivalries between the Latin and the Eastern Orthodox churches regarding the protection of the holy places in Palestine. Who would watch over Bethlehem's churches, hold the keys, and direct the work? How is it possible that such small matters could set two great empires against each other, the French and the Russian? But behind the Latin monks, it's Francis' Catholic party, provided with ancient privileges and supporter of the new regime, behind the growing demands of the Orthodox, who had grown in numbers, is the Russian influence. Unquote. Also, you know, yeah, but that comes a little later. The Russians must be punished for aiding the Americans in the Civil War, but that, that's another case. Now, the Tsar invokes the protection of the Orthodox Church, which he has to assure and, to make it effective, asks that his fleet should use the Dardanelles Passage. England, which is backed by France, refuses, and the war breaks out. Quote, France and England can reach the Tsar only through the Black Sea and the Turkish alliance. From now on, the war in Russia becomes the Crimean War and is entirely centered on the siege of Sebastopol, a costly episode without issue. Bloody battles, deadly epidemics and inhuman sufferings cost France 100,000 dead." Unquote. Now, we must point out that these 100,000 dead were Christ's soldiers and glorious martyrs of the faith, according to Monsignor Cibur, Archbishop of Paris. Yeah? Were they Christ's soldiers? Or were they Roman Catholic soldiers, who are not Christian? The latter, my dear listener. Monsignor Cibur, Archbishop of Paris, declared at that time, quote, The Crimean War between France and Russia is not a political war, but a holy war. It is not a state fighting another state, people fighting other people, but singularly a war of religion. It is a crusade. That's what's it all about. Here at least the Roman Catholic Monsignor Cibur, Archbishop of Paris, says what it is. Exactly like George W. Bush told you Americans that the fight against terrorism is a crusade. I played that in the in in in, in, uh, in in past times in videos of mine, the quote where he says that, and I have a picture uh, where he, where he says that also on the 16th of September 2001, this crusade, a holy war, a spiritual war. Are the Americans to fight spiritual holy wars? If any, I thought that the American soldiers and people were told that they are only fighting wars to defend their republic, their quote-unquote democracy, their freedoms. But like here in the Crimean War, this is a quote-unquote holy war. It is a crusade. The admission is not too ambiguous. Anyway, haven't we heard the same not long ago during the German occupation expounded in identical terms by the prelates of his quote-unquote holiness, Antichrist, Pope Pius XII, and by Pierre Laval himself, president of the Council of Vichy, uh, who was the Council of Vichy? Well, that's something we will learn later on during the Second World War. That is the... Uh, fascist regime in France under the occupation of Germany. 
okay, under the Third Reich. And his quote-unquote holiness Pope Pius XII is Hitler's Pope, Eugenio Pacelli, who we will get to know a little later in this book, extensively. In 1863, it is the expedition to Mexico. But what's it about? To transform a lay republic that was Mexico at that time into an empire and offer it to Maximilian, the Archduke of Austria, the Habsburgs, who were always the stronghold of the Roman Catholic Church in Europe, especially in Germany, Catholic Germany, the quote-unquote um, Holy Roman Empire of German nation that was ruled from Austria and we are going to in, into this even much more in later parts of this book that everything Catholic comes out of the south of Germany Bavaria and Austria we will see that later on but here already it says to transform a lay republic, which, what, which Mexico was. They weren't spiritual, they weren't a theocracy, but they are going to be. Because they want to transform this lay republic of Mexico into an empire and offer it to Maximilian, the Archduke of Austria. Why? Well, because the United States of America is quote-unquote protestant. And you need a Roman Catholic bulwark on the south side of the, uh, of the United States of America. The Roman Catholic Church wanted a defense line, wanted to have their strong influence outside of the U.S. on the borders of U.S. Mexico. That's why they wanted to transform this lay republic Mexico into an empire. A Roman Catholic controlled empire led by the Archduke of Austria, Maximilian, who this was presented to as a gift. Austria is the papacy's number one pillar. The aim is also to erect a barrier which would contain the influence of the Protestant United States over the states of South America strongholds of the Roman Church because South America is also called Latin America. Why is that? Because it is under the influence, it is under the thumb, it is under the yoke of the Latin Roman Catholic Church. M. Albert Bayet wrote with suggestity, quote, The war's aim is to establish a Catholic empire in Mexico and curtail the people's right to self-rule. Because, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to again make a comment here. This is exactly what it's all about. The self-rule is condemned by Pope Pius IX's encyclical of, um, how does he call it, um, the Syllabus of Errors in 1864. Yeah? The people do not have a right to rule themselves. Everyone must be ruled by the Pope of Rome. Going back to Unam Sanctam, Antichrist Pope Boniface VIII in 1303, when he said in the Bulla Unam Sanctam, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. The Roman Catholic Church does not allow any self-rule. So when Mexico here was a lay republic that ruled itself, where the people ruled itself, like America has written in their constitution, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, then the Pope has to intervene. Intervene with a holy war, with a crusade to turn Mexico into a Roman Catholic part of the empire, of the part of the Roman Catholic Empire. The war's aim is to establish a Catholic empire in Mexico and curtail the people's right to self-rule or abolish, as during the Syrian campaign and the two Chinese campaigns attends especially to serve Catholic 
interests." Unquote. We know how, in 1867, after the French army had re-embarked Maximilian, the unfortunate champion of the Holy See was made prisoner when Queretaro surrendered and was shot dead, making way for a republic of which the victor Juarez was president. Now, when you look at the years when this happened, uh, in 1867, that is right at the end of the Civil War of the United States of America, don't you see that that Civil War was also only a distraction? That the American people could not see what was going on south of their borders? When the freedom of the people to rule themselves was taken from the Mexicans and they were put into the Catholic Empire under the rule of Prince Ferdinand of the Austrian of Habsburg, the Archduke of Austria, when the Americans are occupied with their own civil war, they don't care what's going around outside of their borders, right? I think this is also a point that we should address when we study history and see that one war is fought to divert the attention from another war. Now, nevertheless, the time was getting nearer when France was to pay once again much more dearly for the political support the Vatican assured the imperial throne. While the French army was spilling its blood in the four corners of the world and getting weaker while defending interests which were not hers, but the interests of the Roman Catholic Church, Prussia, under the heavy hand of the future Iron Chancellor, which is Bismarck, was busy expanding its military might in order to unite the German states in a single bloc. Unquote. Austria was the first victim of its will and power. In agreement with Prussia, which was to seize the Danish duchess of Schleswig and Holstein, Austria was cheated by her accomplice. The war which followed was soon won by Prussia at Sadowa on the 3rd of July, 1866. And this is about the time when the French troops were revoked from the Vatican that protected the Vatican at that time. The end of the 1260 days, which I was talking about a little bit earlier. It was a terrible blow for the ancient Habsburg monarchy, which was declining. The blow was just as hard for the Vatican, as Austria had been for so long its most faithful stronghold within the Germanic lands. From now on, Protestant Prussia will exercise her hegemony over them. Unless the Roman Church finds a secular arm capable of stopping completely the expansion of the heretic power. <laughs> Without going too far into the future, I can tell you right away, Protestant Prussia took over the rule in Germany and the papacy didn't like it. And you had at that time, of course, uh, Bismarck, uh, who was, let's see where we have uh, Bismarck, do I have him here somewhere as a picture? Uh, no, I'm going to show you a picture of Bismarck, who was the Iron Chancellor of uh, the Second Reich. And... Um, Look, this is just a picture of, of the person himself. This is uh, Bismarck, who was the Protestant Chancellor of Prussia and the founder of the Second German Reich between 1871 and uh, 1918. And here you have a memorial, which is in Hamburg. He, His family comes from outside of Hamburg, where I come from. From now on, the author says... Protestant Prussia will exercise her hegemony over them. Unless the Roman Church finds a secular arm capable of stopping completely the expansion of the heretic power. Well, that's what the Roman Catholic Church did with Adolf Hitler. And we are going into that later on in this book reading. Adolf Hitler comes from Austria. Comes from the land of the Habsburgs. Yeah? And 
started the putsch in Bavaria, a coup d'etat in Bavaria for what he went into prison, and then later he was elevated Chancellor of Germany. He came out of the south of Germany, he came out of Austria, he came out of Bavaria, the Catholic stronghold all the years in Germany. So when the author says here, from now on, Protestant Prussia will exercise her hegemony over them unless the Roman Church finds a secular arm. A secular arm? What was Adolf Hitler? A spiritual arm or a secular arm? Capable of stopping completely the expansion of the heretic power. Meaning, the power of Protestant Russia has to be stopped and therefore the Roman Catholic Church has to find a secular arm to stop it. And that's what they did when they found Adolf Hitler. But how can play this part in Europe apart from the French? How can play who sorry, but who can play this part in Europe apart from the French Empire? Napoleon III, the man sent by Providence, will have the honor uh, will have the honor of Avenging Sadova. Uh, this page just didn't go over. <laughs> the French army is not ready. Quote, the artillery is out of date. Our cannons are still loaded through the muzzle, wrote Rothen, French minister of Frankfurt, who can see disaster coming. Prussia knows of her superiority and our lack of preparation, he adds with many other observers. The war instigators are not concerned. The candidature of a Hohenzollern prince for the vacant Spanish throne is the excuse for that conflict. Also, Bismarck wants it. When he faked the dispatch of Ems, the advocates of war had the game in their hands and they aroused public opinion. France herself declared war. This war of 1870 which was provoked by history to be the work of the Jesuits, as Monsieur Gaston Bally wrote. The composition of the government which sent France to disaster is described as follows by the eminent Catholic historian Adrien Danset. Quote, Napoleon III started by sacrificing Victor Dury, then resolved the appoint uh, to appoint to his government men from the People's Party in January 1870. The new ministers were nearly all sincere Catholics or ecclesiastics believing in social conservatism. Unquote. It is easy to understand now what was inexplicable. The haste of this government of this government to extract a casus belli from this faked dispatch even before receiving a confirmation. We start with a quote. Uh, we end with a quote. The consequences were the collapse of the French Empire and the counter-coup for the papal throne which followed, the imperial edifice and the papal edifice, crowned by the Jesuits, fell in the same mud despite of the immaculate conception and papal infallibility. But alas, it was over the ashes of France. Unquote. Now the references to all these different quotes are given always, given always on the bottom of these pages, uh, so I will not mention them. You can read that for yourself because um, the link to download the book free as a PDF from the internet is provided in the description box of this video, as you know. But this little last quote is very in, uh, interesting to read once again. The imperial edifice and the papal edifice, crowned by the Jesuits, fell in the same mud, in spite of the immaculate conception and papal infallibility. The immaculate conception of Mary and the papal infallibility, which was endorsed, which was put upon uh, the Vatican Council in 1870 by the Jesuits did not stop the coming down of the Second Empire of France. That's why the quote closes, but alas, it was over the ashes of France. France did pay dearly, like all the other countries paid dearly, really dearly, when the Jesuits ruined. That's something that we can 
remember from the reading of today. When we go into the next reading next time, in section 4, chapter 6, the Jesuits in Rome, and the syllabus of error, which we are talking about then next time. But let me assure you that we will see throughout this book reading that in the moments when the Jesuits rule a country, they destroy a country. The Jesuits rule the United States of America and today in 2017, and I don't know when this will be uploaded, you see the destruction of your country. Why? Because the Jesuits rule supreme in a quote-unquote protestant country. Okay, I'm going to stop the reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits right here. And I thank you very much for watching, for listening, for commenting. And uh, until next time when I will return for the next part reading of uh, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Until then, Jocla 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his state. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.